Welcome to the lecture on stress moderators, coping and personality as a part of subject health psychology. You have already learned about existing stress theories and about links between stress and disease. Today, you are going to find answers to the following questions. What are the coping strategies the individual use to handle the stress? What aspects of the individual moderate the negative impact of stress? During upcoming minutes, you are going to learn about stress and coping strategies used for handling stress. You are also going to learn about the role of personality, cognitions and emotions when it comes to the coping strategies used by people. And last but not least, at the end of the lecture, you will be given tips how to make stress your friend. But before we start, let me ask you a question. Think of a recent stressful experience. Try to imagine it as good as possible. What have you done in order to deal with it? Stop this presentation, think about it, and come back when you have your answer. Welcome back. I hope you have your answers. Now, don't stop here and let me continue with two additional questions. Did you try one strategy or several different strategies? How would you describe them? Did your strategy follow any goal? In case of several strategies, were goals different? Once again, stop the presentation and try to find the answers for yourself. Once you have them, come back to the presentation. Let me start with the topic of stress and coping strategies. First of all, it is important to get answers to the two important questions. What is coping and what are functions of coping? Coping is defined as anything a person does to reduce the impact of a perceived or actual stressor. In addition to that, coping is a purposeful effort of a person to alter stressor or how they interpret the stressor in order to make it more favorable. Coping is therefore not a single effort. This is a dynamic process. It is not an automatic reaction, but it requires a conscious effort of the person who is trying to manage the events. Coping has also several functions. Cohen and Lazarus described five main functions, each of which contribute to the successful adaptation to a stressor. First of all, when you are using coping to deal with stressor, your chosen strategy is with a high probability oriented on the reduction of a stressor. If reduction is not possible, coping will be oriented on tolerating and or adjusting to the stressor. In addition to that, with your coping, you should be able to maintain a positive self-image, emotional balance and satisfactory relationships with others. But how does this process actually works? You should be already familiar with this figure by Lazarus from previous lecture on stress theories and on the connection between stress and illness. Today, I want to point your attention to the middle part where the process of coping is being captured. Once you encounter stressor, the process of its appraisal and interpretation starts and it varies according to your goals, your beliefs, your personality and resources. This appraisal and interpretation of stressor along with available internal and external resources will impact which coping strategy you are going to choose and consequently result in short-term outcome such as specific physiological change, physical, emotional and social functioning and long-term outcome uh, uh, such as health or illness. From the previous slide, it is already obvious that several different coping strategies could be used. 
to make an order from the mess of different coping strategies, we can take a look on the following coping dimensions. First, there is a problem-focused versus emotion-focused coping dimension. Second, it is possible to differentiate between active approach-oriented coping versus passive avoidant coping. And third, there is a dimension of adaptive versus maladaptive uh, coping. In the following minutes, we are going to take a closer look on each of those specific ways of coping. Let's start with the first dimension. When I let you think about the recent stressful situation a few minutes ago, your answer for a question, what have you done in order to deal with it, could be, I was thinking about what is best to do to manage the problem, or I spoke to someone who could help me solve the problem. Those answers are typical for a problem-focused coping. This coping strategy is directed at the stressor in order to reduce it or increase the resources to deal with it via cognitive or behavioral efforts. Problem-focused coping strategies are most adaptive for stressors that are changeable. If your answer for a question, what have you done in order to deal with it, was I have decided to find something positive in this situation, or I have told other people how I feel, or I dance on synced my feelings out. You used emotion-focused coping strategy directed at managing the emotional response to the stressor through either emotional reappraising of the stressor in order to see it in a more positive light, or through seeking emotional support, or through emotional venting. Emotion-focused coping strategies are most adaptive when the stressors are unchangeable or in conjunction with problem-focused coping strategies. When it comes to the second dimension, your answer to a question, what have you done in order to deal with it, could be, I was looking for help or advice on the internet. Or, I have told people around me what I need in a given situation. From these answers, it is already obvious that such coping strategy is active and is concerned with the source of stress, trying to deal with it through cognitive and or behavioral efforts like seeking information, seeking help or seeking solutions person is more likely to use these active coping strategies when a stressor is appraised as controllable and a person has a favorable beliefs about their self-efficacy. Extensive body of literature provide evidence for the psychological benefits of active coping strategies over avoidant coping. Your answer to a question, what have you done in order to deal with it, uh, in the second dimension could be also, I wish the situation would disappear or never happen, or I avoided the people that made me feel bad, or I tried not to think about it. Those are examples of avoidant or passive coping strategies concerned with avoiding or minimizing the stressor through wishful thinking, avoidance of source of stressor or denial. Avoidant coping strategies are more likely in situations when a person perceives a stressor as highly threatening and uncontrollable. Recent studies have reinforced the significant association between use of avoidant coping and higher levels of psychological distress and risky health behaviors. Within our third dimension, your answer to what have you done in order to deal with it could be I did something to improve it or I smoked cigarettes, drank alcohol, took medication or other drugs which represent coping strategies directed at either 
adapting to the stressor in a constructive or adapting to the stressor in a destructive approach. It is now clear that in order to handle the stressors, we have an opportunity to choose from a wide variety of strategies. But what influence the way we cope? Why do we choose to cope in the way we do? Please stop the presentation now and try to find your answer to these questions. Once you have it, come back and continue with the lecture. Welcome back and I hope you have your answers. Why do people choose to cope in the way that they do? It uh, highly depends on their past experiences with certain coping responses, but more importantly, it is related to the anticipated outcomes that they believe are going to be a result of their coping strategy. It means that coping is a purposeful or motivational process with a certain goal. General purpose or goal of coping is to manage or understand a situation to make it less distressing with inherent need to maintain one's self-esteem and self-image and to maintain good relations with others. But such a goal is very situation specific and unless we know why a person chooses to cope in a particular way in terms of what they hope to achieve, what their goal is, we cannot tell whether or not that particular coping strategy makes sense and has been effective. People use different coping strategies, often simultaneously, because each one is aiming for a different goal, which might be short-term or long-term. Now, we know people choose their coping strategies every time they encounter a stressor, and the result is not always the same. Let's get back to my question. When you think of a recent stressful experience, what have you done in order to deal with it? And more importantly, can you think of anything in your personality that influence how you responded? Stop this presentation, think about it, and come back when you have your answers. Welcome back. As we now know more about the coping strategies, it is time to dig deeper into one of the aspects that could play an important role here, and it is your personality. What is personality? It can be defined as the dynamic organization within the individual that determine his characteristic behavior and thoughts. This definition reflects a trait approach to personality, which considers a person in terms of stable and enduring dimensions. Eisenberg, in 1970, uh, defined two dimensions, neuroticism and extroversion, and in later years added psychoticism. Over the last 50 years, these three dimensions expanded into five factors, and the model adopted most widely in health psychology, often referred to as the Big Five theory, which conceptualized personality using following dimensions agreeableness, consciousness, extroversion, neuroticism, and openness. One of the potential mechanisms that could explain how personality could play this role is through its indirect effect on health and illness, where general aspects of personality are expected to influence the way in which person appraises the stressor or copes with the stressor. Many associations between these relatively stable personality traits, stress, coping, and health outcomes have been reported in previous research, with some aspects playing a role of a protective factor, e.g. consciousness or openness, while others uh, play a role of risk factor, like neuroticism. Especially neuroticism has received a lot of research attention in relation to stress and to illness. 
it is characterized by the tendency to experience negative emotions and to exhibit associated anxious beliefs and behaviors disproportionate to the situation and was found to predict mortality in a prospective cohort studies even when controlling for known risk factors which uh, with one of the potential mechanisms being the immune suppression Consciousness, defined as being responsible, following social norms, being persistent and self-disciplined, has shown a consistent relationship to positive outcomes, both in relation to stress and to health. Conscious individuals may be more likely to cognitively restructure the situation, solve problem effectively, and seek support. When it comes to the role of personality, our knowledge is not limited only to the Big Five theory. There are also other concepts linked to personality that are being studied. One protective resource to be considered is that of dispositional optimism. Having a generally stable, positive outlook and positive outcome expectations. It was proposed that optimists are predisposed toward believing that desired outcomes are possible and it motivates them to cope more effectively and persistently with stress through active, problem-focused coping strategies and thus reducing their risk of negative outcomes. Another well-known concept is the sense of coherence formulated by Antonovsky as a global orientation that expresses the extent to which one has a pervasive, though dynamic, feeling of confidence that the stimuli deriving from one's internal and external environments in the course of living are structured, predictable and explicable. It makes sense to me. The resources are available to one to meet the demands posed by these stimuli. I have what it takes to do it. These demands are challenges worthy of investment and engagement. It is worth it. Attention in recent decades was also turned to the concept of resilience, ability to thrive or bounce back in spite of negative events. First identified in the 1980s by Smith, following her 40-year birth cohort study of 700 Hawaiian babies and examining their social and academic outcomes in relation to childhood adversity. Smith identified two facets of those who bounce back, an outgoing disposition and an ability to access several sources of social support. Even today, it is expected that resilience consists of sources within individual as well as sources available to the individual from outside in the form of social support leading to questions as to whether resilience is a fixed trait held by a person or an adaptive response that emerges in times of stress. Special research attention was given in the last decade to the concept of personality types being connected with an increased risk of specific diseases. The most known are type A and type C personality. Type A, described by competitiveness, time urgent behavior, hostility and anger, impatience and achievement-oriented behavior, was studied extensively in connection to the coronary heart disease. Type C personality, described by cooperative and appeasing, compliant and passive, stoic, unassertive and self-sacrificing attitude and behavior, as well as inhibition or repression of negative emotions, was studied in connection to the cancer. However, it must be noted that even though there were some studies confirming those uh, associations, additional research sometimes failed to confirm these early associations, leading to inconclusive research findings in this field. Generally, 
to conclude this section on uh, the role of personality, whilst there is reasonably good evidence that aspects of our personality influences our appraisal of events and even cognitive, behavioral, and physiological responses to them, which may result in increased risk of some diseases, the influence of personality on health and illness is obviously only partial, with other aspects being uh, present in this wider picture. It is therefore time to get back to my question and take a look on it uh, from another perspective. When you think of a recent stressful experience, what have you done in order to deal with it? Did your thoughts or emotions influence how you responded? Stop this presentation, think about it and come back when you have your answer. Welcome back. It's once again time to dig deeper into another aspect that could play an important role here, to your cognitions and to your emotions. Before we will continue, I want you once again uh, to think about yourself and to try to find the answer to my following question. When something happens, who is responsible? stop the presentation, think about it, and uh, come back. Welcome back. It is very possible that your answer might be close to the one of the following examples. Uh, it could be something like, uh, when something happens, I am the one responsible, as I like to think that I have control over my life. Or, no matter what I do, bad things are going to happen and there is nothing I can do about it. Or, when something happens, I listen to the others and I do as I am told. Julian Rotter is the one that noted that people differ in how they approach the difficulties, the problems and what attribute uh, the cause of their success and failures. According to his theory on locus of control, on the one hand, there are people with an active attitude to solving problems based on their own abilities, opportunities, capabilities, on their own initiative. We say that they have an internal locus of control. They are relying on themselves, on their internal resources. On the other hand, there are people who believe that the problem is solved by itself or someone will solve it for them. The locus of control is located outside. Each of us falls somewhere between these two poles. Later on, this theory was adapted into multidimensional health locus of control scale by Walston and colleagues, which, in addition to the internal and external locus of control have also added aspect of powerful others as a source of control. Another concept related to the perceived control is perceived self-efficacy based on Albert Bandura's theory. It is subjective belief in ability to control and manage events, belief that people are able to determine and control their internal mental states and their behavior to influence their environment and achieve desirable results. This characteristic is a very effective buffer against stress. It relates to the quality of life, successful coping with difficulties and ability to desirably modify health-related behaviors like smoking or uh, alcohol consumption. Locus of control could be seen as an individual belief that he or she can control outcomes, while self-efficacy could be considered as an individual belief he or she have skills to achieve the desired outcomes. Relevant to the field of stress and coping is also concept of hope and hopelessness introduced by Snyder and colleagues. 
They define the hope as a person's belief that they can set, plan, and achieve goals. Uh, and uh, they uh, emphasize uh, hope as a goal-directed thinking. There is some conceptual overlap with optimism and self-efficacy, as all those constructs focus on individual resources. Uh, however, Snyder explains that hope is about having the motivation, the agency and root, the pathway to achieving such goals. The aspect of hope was also described by Hulkman, to whom hope was uh, more than about the goals. Uh, from his perspective, uh, uh, it is motivational, but it is also about emotions and finding meaning. Concept of hope is one of those referred within a field of study known as positive psychology, where a person's strengths, resources and abilities are focused on rather than on their pathology, limitations or negative emotions and cognitions. Positive psychology is a field of study relevant for the topic of stress, coping and associated health outcomes covers, in addition to those already mentioned, also constructs like positivity, happiness and meaningfulness. Positive psychologists therefore suggest the need to move away from negatives and address the benefits to health and well-being being offered by positive thinking and acting. They believe that happiness is uh, thought to contribute to what Seligman calls uh, desirable lives. Uh, he described them as the pleasant life, the good life and the meaningful life. A pleasant life arises from one that pursues positive emotions. A good life arises from being as well as doing and by being involved in life and all its activities in order to get the best out of it. A meaningful life is when we use our strengths and skills to benefit more than just ourselves. Closely connected to the positive psychology is the concept of meaning-based coping that involves interpretation of a stressful situation in a personally meaningful way. It includes positive reinterpretation, acceptance, and use of religion and spirituality. Already mentioned, but not fully described during this lecture, were emotions and the role they could play in coping. When it comes to the emotions, we could differentiate between expressed emotions, emotional disclosure and emotional mastery. The first one, expressed emotions, could be seen as a venting of negative as well as positive emotions. Emotional disclosure is one step further and covers disclosure of emotional experiences often achieved by describing the experience verbally or in writing. Finally, emotional mastery could be seen as ability to experience and handle the negative emotions. All of those concepts are believed to play their role and help people cope with stressful situations. Now, coming back to our original question, you can see uh, the concept of coping being not that straightforward, but a very complex issue with uh, our uh, personalities, uh, uh, our cognitions and emotions playing an important though not exclusive role as other aspects are expected to enter this picture. However, I will stop here as those other aspects, uh, most dominantly external resources in the forms of social support received from others, will be the topic of the following lecture. And last but not least, on the beginning of this lecture, I promised also tips on how to make stress your friend. In this encore, I will give you a hint of inspiration to all aspects uh, that was covered today in the topic of stress, coping, personality, cognitions and uh, emotions. 
but where to start? Based uh, on what I already know, if I want to make a stress my friend, what should I do? Should I uh, try and change the triggers? How? Should I try to change the way uh, I think? Or should I try to change the way I feel? Or should I try to change the way I act? Well, uh, on this slide you have very inspiring talks focused on different approaches to the stress covering all the topics that uh, was discussed during this lecture. And if that's not enough for you, I highly encourage you to continue with these two talks. If you want to see how a specific intervention might look like, here you will find an example using the sense of coherence concept. Or you can look at these very easy and quick interventions aimed at uh, coping with uh, stress. And finally, in case you want to read more, take a look into one of these books. Thank you for your attention.